Anyhow, it's good to be here. And it's good to be celebrating Thanksgiving. I tell everybody in Canada, we know when Thanksgiving is. In the States, they just kind of tucked it in there just in time to, to wreck Christmas. But, but, but we know when Thanksgiving is, right? And it's great to be thankful, isn't it? It's great to give thanks unto the Lord. And there, there's, a, there's a powerful thing happens when we give thanks to the Lord. It's powerful. Because so often, maybe it's not this way with you. Maybe, maybe it's just this way with everywhere else. But 90% of our prayers is us coming to God wanting stuff. God, I need this. God, I need that. God, I need this. God, I need that. I want this. I need this. And, and, and we spend most of our prayer time telling God all the things we want and all the things we need. Isn't that the truth? And he answers so many of those prayers, and he keeps us safe from harm, and he provides for us, and he does all these wonderful things day after day after day after day in our lives, and yet we keep coming back praying the same old prayers. Lord, I need this. Lord, I want that. Lord, I need this. Lord, I want that. Lord, help this one. Help that one. Do this. Do this. Do this. Do this. And, and, and we spend most of our prayer time telling God all the things we want and all the things we need. But do you know, if you really want to go to the next level, somewhere along your life, you've got to hit the pause button just for a few moments and spend some time giving thanks for all the stuff he's already done. Be thankful, the Bible says, and bless his name. Everybody say, th be thankful. And bless his name. Now, how many here has been blessed by God? How many would like to be able to bless God? Well, one of the things that blesses God and pleases God is when we pause and give thanks for what he's done. When's the last time that you just took a moment in your middle of your prayer time and just gave thanks for salvation? Gave thanks for Calvary. Gave thanks for a word that's forever settled in heaven. Gave thanks for a church that you can be part of. Gave thanks for, for, for pastors and leaders. Gave thanks for, for words that you've received and things that you've seen and, and stuff that's happened. When we learn to be thankful, it moves us up. And a lot of times, being thankful is totally dependent on what we're seeing. Isn't that the truth? We need to start looking for things to thank God for. Instead of just all the time looking for things that we want God to do, we need to start looking for things to give him thanks for. We need to get our eyes in the right place. Does that make sense to you? Yeah. Can you receive that today? That's not a rebuke. That's just, that's just, I'm just telling you what's on my heart this morning. It's Thanksgiving weekend. This has kind of been, been just churning over in, in, the, in the percolator all week long, thinking about coming down here today and thinking about Thanksgiving. And, and, I, and I really believe the Lord just wanted me to share this with you this morning before we get into the Word. Just the, the importance of Thanksgiving and the importance of, of looking for things to be thankful for. Praise God. I was thinking about Paul and Silas in prison. And they're in the bottom of the dungeon, and it's midnight, and it's dark down. There's no lights down there, and they're in stalks and fetters. You know, their arms and feet are fastened in front of them. They've been beaten within a half an inch of their life. The blood's running down their back. The centipedes are crawling in and out of their ears, and the rats are nibbling on their toes, and, and uh, it's dirty. And, and uh, if, you, if, you know how, if, if you know how plumbing works, the bottom of the dungeon is right where all the, the sewer was. It's a bad place to be. It's it's dirty, it stinks, it's dark, and they're in pain. And they got in all this mess because they were doing something good. And sometimes we suffer horribly just because we're trying to do something good. 
And they're down in the middle of the night in this dungeon at the midnight hour. And Paul looks over at Silas and says, I think we're going to quit this ministry stuff. Is that what he said? Silas says, I think we need to send our resignation letter to the board tomorrow. (laughs) No, they had them a little discussion. And they decided that they would have a worship service. And they begin to sing praises to God. And it's really important when you read that story in Acts is, is the time is noted. The Bible says it was the midnight hour. Now, you, you may not have thought about this before, but midnight is the exact moment in time when one day ends and another begins. Like this day will be Sunday right up till midnight. And at the stroke of midnight, it becomes Monday. It's instantaneous. It's, you, you can't even measure it. It just happens. At midnight, the day shifts. At midnight, you go into a new day. How many has had times in your life when you needed a fresh start, when you needed to step into a new day, when you needed to move into a new place, when you needed to go to a new level, when you needed to be nudged out of the mess you're in into a new spot? At midnight, they begin to sing praises to God. And something started happening. Something started moving. Elvis Presley wasn't the first one to sing Jailhouse Rock. It was Paul and Silas. They got singing praises of the Lord, and that place started to shake. Praise God. And they went from, from being candidates for the ER to leading a revival that shook their community in an instant, just simply because they were willing to look to Jesus, the author and the perfecter of their faith, instead of looking at the stuff they were going through and the stuff they were facing and the stuff they were sitting in and the stuff that was all around them, they made a choice to look up and to see Jesus and to give him thanks and praise him at that midnight hour and things began to change. And I'm going to tell you, in your life this morning, there's some stuff that needs to change. There's some stuff that needs to move. There's some things that need to happen in your life. You need to move on to an next level to another spot to another place and what's going to get you there is when you choose to look on the bright side and start worshiping God and praising God and lifting up the name of Jesus and when you begin to give thanks and sing praises to him your day changes praise God that's why David could say about his mercies they're new every morning every morning Every morning, everybody say with me, every day is day one. (laughs) Do you believe that? Fresh start. When I was... uh when I was a kid, we had this toy we called an Etch-A-Sketch. Anybody ever play with one of them? You know that little red frame thing with the little knobs, you know, and we'd amuse ourselves all day. One knob moved the thing right and left, and one knob moved it up and down, and if you were really, really careful and moved them both at the same time, you could get an angle. And we'd be working on one of them. I I remember working on one of them for, for a long, long time, and I had this picture just perfect. And my sister, being a brat, came along. She's here this morning. (laughs) She came and hit my arm. And that knob turned and there was a line right across my picture. And I was so mad. But you know what you do with that thing? You just give it a shake and you start over again. Isn't that right? And that's what singing praises to God does. That's what giving thanks does. It just helps us to shake it off and start over again. Praise God. It's a new day. Can you receive that this morning? Well, I better get to preaching here or I'm going to run out of time before I even get started. Mark chapter 14. 
And verse 1. After two days it was the Passover and the Feast of Unleavened Bread, and the chief priests and the scribes sought how they might take him by trickery and put him to death. But they said, Not during the feast, lest there be an uproar among the people. And being in Bethany at the house of Simon the leper, he sat at the table. As he sat at the table, a woman came having an alabaster flask of very costly oil of spikenard. She broke the flash and flask and poured it on his head. But there were some who were indignant among themselves and said, why was this fragrant oil wasted? For it might have been sold for more than 300 denarii and given to the poor. And they criticized her sharply. But Jesus said, let her alone. Why do you trouble her? She's done a good work for me. For you have the poor with you always, and wherever you wish, you may do them good. But me you do not always have. She has done what she could. She has come beforehand to anoint my body for burial. Assuredly, I say to you, wherever this gospel is preached in the whole world, what this woman has done will be told as a memorial for her. Praise God. Father, we thank you for your word today. And I pray you'll just open up our hearts to receive it and open up our eyes to see, to see, Lord, what's really going on around us. Have your way in our hearts today, we pray in Jesus' name. And everybody said amen. amen. This is the story of a woman who chose to see Jesus and honor him in spite of every obstacle. There's a feast going on and she's not on the guest list. Everybody's gathered in there. They're having themselves a time. And right in the middle of their party, the door flies open, and in comes this woman that nobody invited. She's kind of like the party crasher. You ever meet anybody that, that crashed parties, you know, show up uninvited, get in your space when you didn't want them there? appear at the worst possible times, amen? She comes like that. She was uninvited. She just bursts in. And they're all gathered around, and they start looking at her. You know the eye roll? You ever get the eye roll? You ever give the eye roll? They're all rolling their eyes at her. She's uninvited, She's not supposed to be here. She's not on the list. And you can just hear those old fellows there nudging one another. Who let her in? Who said she could come? Who, 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 let, who let her by, by the gate? How come she's in here? What's she doing here? You know what? We need to get back to the idea of believing it just the way Jesus said it when he said, whosoever will, let him come and drink of the water of life freely. Praise the Lord. She came to see Jesus. She didn't see anybody else. She didn't see the Pharisees. She didn't see the scribes. She didn't see the neighbors. She didn't see the, 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 the gossip. She didn't see the old biddy next door that was just waiting for something to tell. She didn't see anything else. All she could see is Jesus. It's time we got back to the place where we come to church to see Jesus. You know, when I was a kid and then when my children were little, we used to read these nursery rhymes. Remember this little nursery rhyme? It goes like this. It says, Pussycat, Pussycat, where have you been? I've been to London to visit the Queen. Oh, Pussycat, Pussycat, what saw you there? Well, I frightened a mouse under her chair. Remember that story? Now, now, now let's, 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 let's get a little background here. Now, I'm not really a cat lover. I'm not, I promise you. I, I like dogs pretty good, but I, I'm not a real cat lover. My granddaughter and I, we have this ongoing little feud because she loves cats. She has two of them, and, and they're her special babies. And, and, and I tell her, you know, you're, you're wasting your time on those old cats. <laughs> I said, I said, only dogs go to heaven. They even made a movie about it. <laughs> so we have this little thing going all the time, you know. 
And so, so uh, I, I, I tell her that, you know, and she tells me right back, no, that's not so. But so they, imagine this cat, and this stinking old cat. They, they've, they've washed this cat and they've fluffed up its fur and they've got its tail just right and they got a little collar and bell around its neck. And you know, cats, they just kind of, they kind of prance when they walk and they're bringing it in on this leash and, and this thing's got its nose stuck up in the air and it's just, a, just, just, just walking in so, so nice into the, into the grand ballroom and the palace and, and, and the queen is sitting up there on her throne and, and this cat is coming in and the cat doesn't notice the tapestries and doesn't notice the splendor and doesn't see the jewels and doesn't see the throne, doesn't even see the queen. All the cat can see is a stinking rat. <laughs> Boom, and then the cat's gone. And if you come to church rat hunting, they're here. Amen. There is no perfect church. This one obviously isn't perfect because they let you in. If this was a perfect church, you wouldn't have me here preaching. If I was a perfect preacher, I don't know where else I'd be, but it probably wouldn't be here. If you ever find a perfect church, don't join it because the day they accept your membership, you just ruined it. Amen? If you choose to see the rat, you'll find the rat. He's here. He's, he's around. They, they're everywhere. That's the story of this stupid cat. All the pomp, all the splendor, all the tapestries, all the ceremony, all of the jewels, all the splendor, the queen herself, and he doesn't see one bit of it. And that's what happens to us sometimes when we come into the presence of the Lord. We're so busy looking at this and we're looking at that and we're looking at something else and we're looking at something else and we fail to see what's really going on. And that's the King of Kings and the Lord of Lords in all his splendor, sitting high upon his throne, high and lifted up and his train fills the temple and his glory fills the house. And we need to start believing that the most important thing we can see when we come to church is Jesus. Praise the Lord. And so, so she, she, she's there, this, this woman, she comes in. She doesn't notice the scribes. She doesn't notice the Pharisees. She doesn't notice even Simon, the owner of the house. She doesn't notice anything. Her eyes are on one thing and one thing alone. Jesus, Jesus, Jesus. I came to see Jesus. And she's just zeroed right in and focused on one thing. I have come to the house today to see Jesus. I am in this place today to see Jesus. I have went through all the stuff that I've gone through so that I can bless Jesus. Praise the Lord. Church needs to be about Jesus. Now, I've traveled around a little bit over the years, you know, I've been going back and forth across this country for 40 some years. And I've been in big churches and small churches and, and lively churches and dead churches and some that, that hung the name church on that shouldn't have had the sign on at all. And, and uh, I've been in all kinds of places. I have. And everywhere you go, you hear the same things. It, not, nothing suits everybody all the time. Well, the music's too loud. Well, it's not loud enough. Well, they should sing more new songs. Well, they should sing more old songs. Well, the preacher's too long. Well, he's not long enough. He's so loud. I wish he would talk a little more dignified. And just on and on and on and on and on it goes. And there's always somebody crabbing about something. It's high time that we awake out of sleep and get our eyes back on the real reason we're here. And the reason we're here is to lift up Jesus. Praise the Lord. And if we're here to lift up Jesus, it don't matter if it's somebody squeaking on an accordion or somebody playing electric guitar skillfully with a loud noise or Paul beating away on the drums or somebody on the keyboard or somebody dancing or running the aisles. It really doesn't matter because the only thing we're going to see anyway is Jesus. She wasn't invited, but she came anyway. And she wasn't intimidated. 
I like that. You ever go somewhere and feel out of place? You ever go to church and feel out of place? You know, you come in, you sit down, and, and then all of a sudden you just kind of, you just get this feeling and you look. And I, I, in my younger years, I was, I was asked to preach at this convention. And I don't even know how it came. It, it had to be a God thing because there's no, there's, no, there's no reasonable explanation for it. I met the president of this college, and uh, he, he knew some people that knew me well. And they had told him about me, and through the course of time, we met. And I don't know how it came about. He said, he said, we have a conference coming up at the school, and uh, he said, I'd like you to come on such and such a day and speak at this conference. And I was younger then, and... And I wore my hair really long, and I had a Fu Manchu mustache. And, and that was back when pastors all wore really nice suits, and I was wearing just, just kind of casual pants and suspenders and a striped shirt and long hair in the back and a Fu Manchu. And, and I come strolling into this convention. And I walk up, and I sit down on the front row, and they're looking at me like, like I just, I just rolled in from Iran into Jerusalem at 11 o'clock at night. <laughs> and I mean, it, I was getting the look, like, like what's, who's this? What's he doing here? And finally, somebody came down and, and shook my hand and introduced themselves and said, said uh, What's your name? I said, well, I'm, I'm Ken's daughter. I'm supposed to preach here this afternoon. <laughs> and the eyes got big. Because this place, like this, this, this college had a really strict dress code and music code and everything else. And, and I mean, I was as far out of the box as you could imagine. And the president of the whole operation had invited me personally to come. So I get up to preach and I'm in violation of every single dress code and rule and everything else that they stand for. And I'm introduced by the president himself, said, I've brought this young man here to preach to us today because I, I felt that the Lord didn't invite him to come. So he, he, he came. And I get up there to preach, and they're looking at me like, man, it's, it's, uh, I was getting the eye roll. It was wild. So I sat down at the piano, and Started to sing a little bit. I was singing some really new worship songs, which wasn't on their approval list yet, I guess. Some of them had, had, uh, had a bootleg copy or two of it they listened to on the sly, you know. And, and so I'm singing this, this music, and, and uh, I do my thing, and then I get up and I preach. And lo and behold, about halfway through the message, the Spirit of the Lord just swept into that place. The, the glory of the Lord just fell. It was awesome. And uh, by the time we were done there, um, you couldn't hardly walk out of the place. Everybody was laid out on the floor in every direction. They were all cross-piled in there, and the Lord was moving, and the prophetic words were flowing, and people were getting all kinds of stuff from the Lord, and it was awesome. And uh, years later, I was in a church service preaching, and this couple came up to me, and they told me about being in the service that day and how that when I stepped up to the pulpit, they were just, they blew their mind. They were flabbergasted. There was just no way that, that I should have been there. And they were tuning me out. And then the Lord got to working and they started tuning me in. And they received something in that service that day. And years later, they were still in full-time ministry. But that was the day that God got a hold of their hearts and launched them into the ministry. And then they told me about others that were in the service that day and things that had happened that day. I didn't know. I didn't know anybody there. I didn't know anybody's name. I'd never been there before. And uh, I, I didn't know anyone. But God has a way of showing up when we put our minds on him. 
That's the way this woman was. She comes in there and she, she, she breaks this, this jar of ointment, this, this oil, and the fragrance fills the room and she pours it out on his head and people start criticizing. They start murmuring. Who does she think she is? Why is he letting her touch him? Does he know what kind of woman that is? Do, do, does he know where she's been and where, where, where she come from? And, and, and by the way, that, that, what, what a waste. That's a waste of that good ointment. They, they could sell that and give the money to the poor and they're just going on and on and on. And you ever notice that when people get on a roll, them negative rolls, that it just keeps going and going and going and going and going and it never stops and it just, and it just snowballs. And the more they talk, the worse it looks. And the more they talk, the bigger it gets. And the more they talk, the, the, more, the more serious it must be. And finally, Jesus looks at them. And I like what he says. I'm going to paraphrase it a little bit. He says, shut up and leave her alone. Stop. Just stop. Clue in here to what's really going on. Think about what you're saying. Think about what's happening here. This woman has come in here uninvited, unwelcome, and she come anyway and she has just poured out her absolute most precious possession on me. And this is where it gets really powerful. He said, as long as the gospel is preached forever and a day down the road, they're going to tell her story. This has just went past the normal and this has now become a supernatural event, an eternal event. 2,000 years from now, they're going to be preaching, they're going to be telling this story. 2,500 years down the road, if somebody's preaching the gospel, they're going to be telling this story. 10,000 years from now, if there's still somebody preaching the gospel, they're going to be telling this story because she did what she could. There's one thing that all of us can do. Let's give thanks. Every one of us can give thanks. We've all got something to be thankful for. Praise the Lord. Do you have something to be thankful for? How many got something to be thankful for? So often we look at the wrong things. We're like the guy that Jesus spit on the ground, put the spit in his eyes and said, how do you see? And he said, I see men as trees walking. How many remembers that story? And Jesus touched him again and he saw every man clearly. I really think what needs to happen is we need to get that second touch get our eyes open. See, sometimes we come to church and we can see bad things, but we don't see good things. Is that right? Sometimes we see what the devil's doing, but we don't see what God's doing. Amen. Anybody besides me ever been guilty of that? You know, the devil's doing this, the devil's doing that, this is going on, that's going on, this is bad, this is getting worse, and on and on and on and on. Paul said where sin abounded, grace did much more abound. We need to start seeing the much more. We, we've got people that, that come and they can, uh, they can see the past, but they can't see the future. They can tell you everything you did, when you did it, and who you did it with. Hello? But they, but they can't see the change, the different direction, what's coming. They see the past, but they don't see the future. 
You know, the devil likes to remind you of your past. Whenever he reminds you where you've been, you need to remind him where he's going. <laughs> Amen? Amen? Praise the Lord. We need, to get, we need to get out of that what happened a long time ago business and start looking ahead, looking unto Jesus, the author and the perfecter of our faith, who for the joy set before him, not for the junk behind him, for the joy set before him, he endured the cross, despising the shame, and is now set down at the right hand of the Father on high. That comes from looking ahead. Amen? I could go on and on with this, but they, they can see darkness, but they can't see light. They can see, they can see damage, but they can't see something being built. We need to get our eyes at the right place. That's what this woman did. Everybody else there was looking at the wrong thing. If you come to church looking at the wrong thing, if you live your life looking at the wrong thing, if you go through, go to your job looking at the wrong thing, there's always going to be something to drag you down. You can, if you choose, you can find something to be miserable about all the time. Amen? That's the truth. I had a couple sit in my office one day and, and uh, they were having some problems. And I said, well, let's talk about this. It was the wrong thing to say. <laughs> she started talking. I think we could have went to McDonald's and had a hamburger and come back and she'd still been doing it. <laughs> he does this, he does that, he does it. He, he don't do this. And just on and on and on and on and on. And finally I said, listen, I said, does, does he love you? Well, yeah. Is he a good father to those children? Yeah. Does he get up every morning and go to work? Well, yeah. Does he bring his paycheck home every week? Yeah. Well, I said, you got a lot going for you right there already. So you don't, he don't abuse you. He don't do this. He don't do that. He don't do something else. He, he's, he's, he's not perfect. I know he's not perfect, but, but there's potential there. It's not as bad as you think. And we got to laughing and carrying on a little bit. And before we were done, we prayed together, and they're still together, and it's a few years later, and things are getting better. But she told me one day, she said, I just was looking at the wrong thing all the time. There's always something wrong. There's always something wrong, but there's always something right. This woman pours out her ointment to Jesus, and he says, she's done a good thing. It's Thanksgiving. It's Thanksgiving, and we come together. We're in the house of the Lord together, and, and, and we look around, and and there's a whole lot of imperfect people sitting here with us. That's why they let you in. Amen. And Jesus said, I didn't come for the righteous. I came for the sinner. He said, the well don't need the doctor, the sick do. He said, I'm come for the lost sheep. It's time we get our eyes back on Jesus. It says, it's time we get our eyes back on Jesus. It's time we get our eyes back on Jesus. Well, when this woman who refused to be intimidated, she refused to be stopped, she refused to be turned aside, Jesus tells a little story about two debtors. And he said, who do you suppose loves the master the most? And of course, the obvious answer is the one who was forgiven the most. Jesus basically says, I rest my case. It's time we love him in spite of our shortcomings, 
in spite of our failures, in spite of our mistakes, in spite of everything that's wrong in our life, there's some good going on too. We got a lot to be thankful for. A lot to be thankful for. Praise the Lord. Everybody's got a story. I said, everybody's got a story. You've got a story. I've got a story. And in that story, there are times when we were up on the mountain. And there's times we're down in the valley. There's times when things are going really, really good. And there's times when they haven't been going really good. You know, that, that's almost one of the, the dangerous things about social media. You know, everybody puts all this good stuff on there all the time, you know. And, and, and we look at somebody else's life and, and think, oh, man, their, their life is so good. They got this. They did that. They went here. They're, they're going there. Look, look at what they're doing. And then we look at our own life and we think, my life's not like that. Theirs ain't either. <laughs> Amen. You're just seeing a little, a little glimpse of what they want you to see. The truth of the matter is we all have our ups and downs. We all have our shortcomings. We all make our mistakes. We all have our faults and our failures. But his mercy endures forever. Praise God. And no matter how bad we mess up, He never stops loving us. He never stops calling for us. He never stops reaching for us. He never stops running towards us. You know, in all, all the stories Jesus told, there's, there's only one illustration where you see God in a hurry. And that's the story of the prodigal son. The Bible says, while he was a great way off, the father saw him, had compassion on him, and ran to meet him. You want to see God in a hurry? He gets in a hurry when somebody turns toward him and says, help. He comes running. He comes running. That's the kind of God we serve. That's the kind of God that, that loves you. That's the kind of God that cares for you. That, that he looks beyond your faults. He sees your heart. And he says, come unto me. And he doesn't say, come unto me, all ye who are perfect. All ye who are without blemish. All ye who, who never made a mistake. All ye who, who are, are righteous and holy and, 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 and upward and, and, and just model saints. No, he says, come unto me, all ye that labor and are heavy laden, all you that are messed up, all you that made mistakes, all you that are carrying burdens, all you that are, are dragging your feet, come, and I'll give you rest. You think we got something to be thankful for today? Let's stand together. I'm going to stop right there. Because I really believe with all my heart, I really believe with all my heart that the key, the key to the next level is being thankful. I shared this last night, and I'm just going to just toss this out here before we come to pray. I'll get the musicians to come on back here if you would. Come on, come on right up here, all you worshipers, and get us, get us ready to roll here, but... I mentioned this last night. If you weren't here last night, I'll mention it again this morning. The, the story of the ten lepers is a great story of thankfulness. You know, Jesus, he comes across these ten lepers, and he has compassion on them, and he says, go show yourselves to the priests. And the Bible says that as they went, they were healed of their leprosy. How many has read that story or heard that story? A little while later, one of them shows up again where Jesus is and falls on his face at Jesus' feet and begins to worship him and thank him. And Jesus says, weren't 10 cleansed? Where's the other nine? And how is it that the one that comes back, he's not even Jew, he's a Samaritan. 
And Jesus makes note of this. And in the story, the Bible says, as they went, they were healed of their leprosy. And I mentioned this last night, but I'll mention it again. Leprosy is a disease that disfigures you horribly. People that have leprosy, it kills the nerve endings. They can't feel pain, and so they destroy themselves. Most people with leprosy for a long time, they're missing fingers or missing parts of their face. They're missing their ears or nose, whatever, because they don't feel pain. And they, they literally, they destroy themselves. And... You, you've seen the pictures on the TV of the ads, you know, for donations for the leper colonies and stuff. And, and the Bible says as they went, they were healed of their leprosy. It means that as they went, whatever, wherever they had leprosy, it was gone. But they're still horribly scarred and disfigured. You know, if they're, if they're missing a finger, the leprosy's gone, but they're still missing that finger. They're missing something, it's gone. But the leprosy's gone. They're, they're healed. But this 10th guy that comes back Jesus says to him, go in peace. Your faith has made you whole. And it's important to note that because that word there, and some of the newer translations say well, but it comes from the same Greek word that means literally nothing missing, nothing broken. What it means is this 10th guy that came back and gave thanks Everything that the leprosy had taken away, God gave it back. Whatever he was gone came back. If he was missing his ear, it came back. If he was missing his finger, it came back. If he was missing his nose, it came back. Whatever the leprosy took away, he got it back. And the reason he got that next level is because he was willing to give thanks and praise the Lord. Hallelujah. I'm telling you, there's power in pausing and giving thanks to the Lord. You can be healed, you can be delivered, you can be set free, you can be saved, and that'd be the end of the story. Or you can choose to be thankful and see what's waiting on the next level. How high do you want to go with this thing? How far do you want to go with this thing? How hungry are you to get it all? I want to see us come to the place where our praise and our thanksgiving is so intense that the devil shows up at the door and says, here, everything I took for you, take it back. I don't want to deal with you guys anymore. Praise the Lord. I think it's time that we went to the enemy's camp and took back everything he stole from us. And the way we do that is give thanks to the Lord. Praise the Lord. How many wants to be thankful? <laughs> Let's be thankful and bless his name. Let's give thanks right now. Rip your hands right up and give thanks to the Lord. Begin to thank him. Thank him for his love. Thank him for his mercy. Thank him for salvation. <laughs> Thank you for a word that's forever settled. Thank you, Lord, for, for loving us when nobody else did. Thank you, Lord, for lifting us up when we were down. For moving us forward when we were dragging our feet. For giving us a nudge when we didn't want to be moved. Thank you, Lord. Thank you, Lord. Thank you, Lord. And Lord, we're going to start thanking in advance for all the stuff that's coming back. We're going to see people come back. We're going to see ministries come back. We're going to see glory come back. We're going to see liberty come back. We're going to see health come back and finances come back. And whatever it is that's been missing, God says, I'm going to make you whole. Can you receive that? Can you receive that in Jesus' name? Praise the Lord. We hope this message has encouraged you in your relationship with the Lord. For more information and ministry resources, we invite you to visit our website at www.newcovenantchurch.ca. We look forward to you joining us next time as we continue to live victoriously.